Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the PD for today, October 21st, 2021. I apologize that um, the deputy has um, a prior meeting that has ran over. And so we're going to step in and um, forward to uh, the next slides. So I want to welcome everyone. Um, if you could go past, oh, there she is. You made it. The deputy is here. Take it away, Deputy. Thanks, Latasha. Good morning, everyone. Um, and again, as you see here on the slide, we're asking everyone to go ahead and sign in via the chat um, so that we can ensure that we have attendance for today's meeting. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, please. And so we've got quite a few things that we're going to cover today. Um, we do have a couple of presentations that are going to end the meeting today. So I'm asking that everybody um, stay with us. Um, we do have information about lead and water. Elevate Energy is going to be here with us. Um, we've got um, IFF that's going to talk about uh, facilities and some opportunities. Uh, Via Creative is here uh, to give you an update on marketing and messaging. And then we've got STGI, which is the TNTA um, t arm for uh, Region 5. And so they're going to be here talking about health and safety as well. So I'm asking everybody to stay through, stay with us. Um, and we're going to go ahead and jump in so that everyone gets a chance uh, to give their presentations this morning. So a um, couple of updates from me. I'm going to uh, be swift as I go through this because I do want to make sure that we preserve time on the other end. Um, just wanting to go back, and this is just going to take us back two years to um, something that we did in uh, November of 2019. And we launched us into um, what we talked about was health and safety and making sure that every child um, that we serve is that's in our hand of care, um, that they're safe, that we're doing everything that we can to provide that. And I just want to remind everyone um, of our responsibility in this field for ensuring that children are in safe hands, in safe environments, and that you as um, those administering these programs have done everything you can to ensure um, that those kinds of things are happening in every one of your classrooms for every um, age of child that you serve. So with that, a couple of things that we recognize having come through and still in a pandemic is we've got to really look at staff wellness. We've got, got to really keep our hands on what's going on with those individuals who are charged in, uh, with taking care of children. Um, they are in a pandemic as well, just like the families we serve. They're suffering through just like the rest of us. And that their mental health is key right now. And so one of the things that we have asked for um, is to make sure that everyone has a staff wellness plan, that you're thinking about internally, what's in your policies and procedures, and how are you ensuring um, that you have systems in place to help your staff see their way through so that they are able to be as safe in their own personal life and also in your facilities. What all kinds of things do you need and what do you offer? You may have an employee assistance program. You may have something that's built into your health uh, program that allows them to seek support. Um, but if not, one of the things I do want you to understand is the dollars that are coming out from HHS um, around um, the American Rescue um, Plan, a lot of those dollars um, are there to help us support and think about how we can engage and make sure that we have these plans in place, but not just a plan, but we have actions, items built into those plans that we're actually working with our staff and we are seeing them and understanding what's going on and then can help them um, engage in services if need be. The other one on there is about staff levels and making sure that we understand what the requirements are for the number of bodies that need to be in a classroom, what those credential needs are, um, and making sure that we've got enough individuals in there. Um, one of the things that we know, groups of children are at risk when we don't have enough adults in care with them. And so making sure that we know what's going on, we're going to be in touch with all of you looking at our staff levels, looking at the credentials, making some decisions about we, where we are and where we go from here. And so the, it's gonna be more work that we're going to be doing on behalf um, of the grantee here and, your, and the, those that we fund under us, um, but there are gonna be work that we're gonna be doing hand in hand with all of you as well. I do know that there was a request, a survey they went out regarding say, um, staff wellness plans. And so I'm gonna be looking at the data that comes back and then reaching out accordingly. Um, we do have mandates. Again, I know we're in October, 
uh, wanting to make sure that everybody still understands that in-person learning is required for all of our funded models. And so we're anticipating that there are children in classrooms, um, that you've worked out home visiting, that we're doing all these different things and thinking about how we do uh, what it is that we do based on the funding that you've received. Yes, we're still in a pandemic and we recognize that. We do recognize we're getting some positive cases and some classrooms are closing um, as well they should based on what the CDC, um, Chicago Department of Public Health is recommending. Um, but we should have systems in place that we've been following and we need to be continuing to follow those. Um, but we definitely need to be doing in-person learning around everything else that's going on. And acknowledging that it's difficult, but it is our responsibility. I just wanna acknowledge that. Uh, we are under a federal vaccine mandate and I want everyone who is federally funded to understand that does include you. That when we say federal, when we say vaccine mandate, one of the things we need to understand and want those that have federal dollars to understand, when President Biden said there is a federal vaccine mandate, he also included Head Start, Early Head Start. There, there is guidance that we're waiting on that's coming to us from um, Office of Head Start that will help us with some of that. But in the interim, I do want to make sure that people have started thinking about on your side, when you're thinking about your agency policies and procedures, are you going to mandate vaccines within your organization, meaning changing your agency policy and procedure to include um, vaccine mandates? Um, and start thinking about that now if you've got federal dollars, because this is a mandate uh, that has come to us from the federal government. Um, next, ne at our next meeting in November, CDPH will be present. Um, they will talk a little bit more about that vaccine mandates. Um, I, they were unable to be with us today, but they will be with us at our next meeting and we'll be able to answer some of your additional questions around vaccine mandates at that particular time. But again, I need everyone to understand if you have federal dollars, Head Start, Early Head Start, Early Head Start CCP or Early Head Start Expansion, you are within that federal mandate for vaccines and we will be talking to you more. We will be giving you guidance that we are receiving from Office of Head Start. I just wanted to put this on your radar that there's going to be more discussions that we will all have around vaccines and vaccine mandates. As a city of Chicago, um, as employees of the city of Chicago, I'm sure you've heard, uh, we are under a vaccine mandate um, and, and it, it ours went into effect October 15th. And so I know some of you, some organizations um, have mandated vaccines. Everyone hasn't, um, but we will be talking about what the policy procedure and the guidance uh, that we, are, we will be receiving and sharing with you. Again, I would suggest that you start thinking about it at your organization. So when we meet further, uh, you're ready and prepared to talk about some of the things that's going on in your own house around vaccine mandates. I do see, see that there are some questions in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the new data system first, and then I'm gonna come back to the chat quickly to see if I can answer questions. Um, we are in the process of discussions and planning around a new data system um, and a new application system. And so just wanting to put that on your radar, uh, what we're looking for is new systems that will be implemented in 2022. Um, and so know that we are planning, which means we will be engaging our community, you, around these new systems um, because you will be using these systems on the other side. And so just wanting to lift that for you right now, it's internal. Um, we are having meetings right now, talking to uh, vendors and things that we're doing on our side, meaning uh, DFSS, what, but we will begin uh, the process of engaging um, our community, meaning you uh, late fall, talking about um, both the new data system and also the application system. Application system, meaning uh, where parents currently go in um, and apply for early learning programs. And so lots more information to come on that, but I wanna put it on your radar. Uh, we will be wanting to engage. We will be wanting uh, to talk to and have staff um, who are um, right now in the COPA system, um, understanding from you, your user face interface and everything on that side. Um, and I see a question just popped up. Yes, the, app, the new data system would in fact replace the current COPA system that we have. And so I'm gonna open up the chat really quickly just to see if I can answer a couple of questions. Um, what do we do about staff who refuse to be vaccinated? That's gonna be some, something that has to be crafted into your policies. Um, again, for example, within the city, um, everybody who doesn't, for example, then we put in the, the requirement up into a certain date that, that people have to test a few times a week. Just putting something out there, um, but more information will, will come 
Um, and we're gonna talk more and go in more detail about vaccine mandates and try to help you through uh, some of what it is that we're talking about. But just wanting everybody to start internally thinking about it, if you already have a policy, uh, wanting to make sure that the right things are in there. But to those who have federal dollars, understand that this is a mandate. It is a mandate for, um, it's, and one of the questions is it for the whole agency or just those in Head Start classrooms? Again, it's, it would be anybody who is charged to the Head Start grant $1. If you've got Head Start, a dollar of Head Start, then it becomes a question about how do we then ensure that that facility is safe for children? Um, so again, we will be talking a little bit more. One of the things that we are waiting on is some of the guidance that's gonna come to us from Head Start, um, and that will help us because uh, being the federal funder, they're getting their information in DC and they will be distrib distributing it to us. So I don't wanna overspeak what's going to be in there. But what I do want everybody to understand is we are under a federal mandate for vaccines. We know there's been some vaccine hesitancy. We know there is still vaccine hesitancy out there. And so unless you have certain parameters that allow you to not be vac vaccinated, if there's a vaccine mandate, um, and unless there's health or some other concerns, it is part of and parcel of what it is that you would be asked to do. Um, and so these are things that we will be talking about in the way to write your policy, um, what kinds of things should be in your policy so that you are covered. Um, but again, making sure the staff understand the requirement, making sure that they understand what it would mean if they didn't get vaccined as an employee of your organization are all those things that you need to start thinking about. You have boards, you have other people who need to be engaged in this conversation. I'm just asking that people begin to start thinking about that um, as we move forward um, in this new arena where vaccines are becoming um, the, the mandate um, as we've always had. We've had vaccine mandates in early learning for many, many years. Um, this isn't new, it's new regarding COVID vaccines. Um, and so there's always already things in your documents where you are saying that children have to be vaccinated and then saying, you know, what are the exceptions to those rules? So you already have some things that you need to be looking at, and now you need to be updating some of that for COVID vaccines as well. So again, giving you a heads up and just getting you started on some of those discussions. And so again, more information to come, more clarity to come. Um, and again, this is something that needs to be embedded in your policies and in your procedures. And from looking at the chat box, I think I've answered the questions uh, that were there for me. And I'm going to now go ahead and say, let's move on to the next slide. And I believe it's admin. All right, good morning. Thank you guys for being on the executive director program directors meeting. We are on a time crunch because we have a full schedule for you. And so um, I wanna go ahead and get through uh, the updates and try and answer a few questions if I can, if time permits. Uh, the very first item that I wanted to talk about is the uh, uh, delegate agency's letters of certification for the Citywide Parent Policy Council. We really do need those letters to be in. Um, as of yesterday, I only had five letters. And so I have 26 federal delegate, uh, delegate agencies. And so I need a letter of certification from every delegate agency. And one of the questions I want you to think about um, you know, as we kind of embark upon this and, and kind of do our reach outs to you regarding these letters of certifications is where are you at with electing your policy committees at your various uh, delegate agencies? In order to uh, reach this point where you're able to go ahead and have an election for a delegate or alternate to, to the citywide parent policy council, you would have had to already went through your election process through your, uh, you know, to elect your policy committee. Um, so our, our office will be following up um, as we, we held elections um, earlier this month, um, last week, as a matter of fact, and um, it was poorly attended. So I really do need your cooperation and being able to make sure um, that we can get uh, the parent bodies to the table so that we can make sure that we have a robust uh, policy council as we move forward. Um, full enrollment. Um, we do have a full enrollment mandate. And um, right now we are working with delegate agencies. Some of you guys are doing well um, and others need help. <laughs> and so, um, you know, one of the things I want you to think about is what you're doing out there um, in your local communities to make sure that you are helping yourselves as far as trying to get children enrolled in the program. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we did through um, our DS, our DRS application was made sure that we had more early Head Start slots that were gonna be available um, in comparison to the number of Head Starts 
Head Start slots that we had because we knew that there were the three um, you know, slots are definitely in need in our various communities. I definitely need our delegate agencies who've been awarded EHS slots to show up and show out in that area. And right now, enrollment is low and um, we will be following up with our delegate agencies um, regarding your attendance, um, regarding your enrollment, um, lack thereof. <laughs> we just need to make sure that we get there. And when we get there, when we reach full enrollment, we have to make sure that we're maintaining full enrollment. So we all have a responsibility to it. Um, right now, our numbers are not looking good, um, but I will be reaching out to, to you um, to be able to have those conversations. Um, I think this is not a surprise, but if we're not able to reach full enrollment with you, maybe I can reach it with someone else. And so I don't wanna have that conversation today, I think that we need to talk about the strategies in order to get you there. What are you doing at your organizations to make sure that you're reaching out to um, you know, families, the most vulnerable families, marginalized communities, to make sure that you can kind of you know, uh, see it through. The next uh, item I wanted to talk about was um, the CRF contracts. Um, we sent out contracts for the corona uh, relief funds and the coronavirus relief funds. And so those contracts will be from October 1st to December 31st. And so those went out to agencies that were affected by DRS. So those who are unfunded and underfunded. And so, um, you know, if you receive those items, there is a one page um, scope of service that does need to be turned in as well. And all of the items contractually that need to be uh, submitted. I just want to make sure that you guys are getting in all the paperwork that you need so we can execute the contracts and there are no delays on getting you the funding. Um, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to go ahead and, uh, and send me an email. If you need uh, the scope of service form for the CRF funds, please reach out to me as well. We'll make sure that we get you what you need. Um, for the fiscal year um, 2022 Head Start, Early Head Start, Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, Early Head Start Expansion grant application, we did submit on October the 8th. Um, yay. <laughs> I want to thank everyone um, for um, working with us um, and, of course, meeting some very tough deadlines. Um, there are some still, there still are some outstanding items. Um, with a few of you, you do know who you are. I'm constantly in communication with you. Um, even though we've submitted the grant application, one of the things that we need to make sure that we're prepared to do is any follow-up. And we know that there's going to be follow-up that's needed, um, especially on those things that, that remained outstanding as of October the 8th. The other thing is that um, our funder, HHS, they have been reviewing our grants already. And so they're already sending back corrections. We've gotten corrections back, at least on the fiscal portions of our CCP uh, grant and also our expansion grant. And so we haven't gotten anything back from Head Start, early Head Start yet, but we do anticipate it. And so I'm just letting you know, as you know, we get corrections that are needed back from our funder, we will be reaching out to you immediately. When we have corrections that are needed, these are things that cannot wait. I can't wait on you to take a week to go ahead and respond back to me. Unfortunately, they don't give us that much time. And so these are things that, although you know, I understand um, that um, everything is time, time sensitive in this space. And so when I wind up giving you a deadline of 24 hours or 48 hours, I really need that, that to be respected because we do have to get back to our funder and we're fighting for every second. Uh, being able to go ahead and get an approval on these grants, which starts December 1st. So um, I appreciate your cooperation in advance and thank you guys for um, submitting those grant applications. The next item I wanted to talk about is the notice of awards. We got um, a notice of awards, a couple of different ones. Um, Sarifa kind of mentioned ARP. And so the American Rescue Plan, we did get 5.2 uh, million in ARP funding. You see the project period there is for a two year period. Um, we're not holding back on you, by the way, even though it's from July 1st, 2021, we didn't actually get the award um, during that time. So um, we're at a point now where um, we are starting to make plans for how we're going to go ahead and execute and spend the funding. One of the things I do want to say, there's a program instruction out. I, I encourage you all to read it. It was issued back in May um, for ARP funding, and there's three main categories for spending ARP funds. Um, the first one is uh, the reach um, to enroll families, children and families. So things like, you know, enrollment and recruitment efforts, 
um, being able to target um, our homeless population, as well as uh, children with disabilities. Um, those, those types of efforts um, can be supported with ARP funding. Um, in addition to that, there's a couple of more categories. Um, facility improvements um, that really deal with the coronavirus. So for instance, not that you can go ahead and say, well, Tiffany, I wanna go ahead and get a new roof. That wouldn't be covered, but something like improving your ventilation system because you wanna make sure that the air is circulating properly um, to reduce transmission within your, you know, your facility. Something like that can be supported. And so, um, you know, facility improvements that really support uh, the mitigation of spreading the coronavirus. And so we'll handle those on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but I do want you guys to go and kind of read, um, you know, that particular program instruction from the federal government, because I think it will be very informative. Um, the third category is to support Head Start staff um, and things like wellness plans. So Rachel had mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, if you have an EAP program or, want to or you want to start an employee's assistant program, um, you know, staff, um, they're also going through. So mental health and making sure that they're intact. Um, and, you know, as we put them in front of children each and every day, we want to make sure that we're checking for their wellness as well. And so these are some of the things that can be covered when we're talking about the ARP funds. So ARP, you know, in addition to those things that um, COVID mitigation strategies as well can be covered under ARP. Um, that money is a little bit more flexible. Of course, it's all non-personnel. It's one-time funding. Um, and so we want to be uh, make sure that we're in line um, with those allowable costs for ARP. CARES Act, of course, is a little bit more restrictive. We do have 5.2 million in CARES as well. And uh, a lot of the similar things that we've done with CARES before um, can still apply uh, this go round as well. We will be getting back to you guys, letting you know what the allocations will be per child. Um, but just know that that information is, is forthcoming. Um, and we're really excited to be getting uh, this additional revenue. Um, we had unspent money under our old CARES um, grant that we had gotten, I want to say a year or two, about a year and a half ago, and we finally got approved for a carryover, and so I didn't put it here, but we did get a, a carryover of CARES dollars um, of a little over a million dollars, and so uh, all that combined, we have about a good 11 million dollars to be able to spend in this space, and so we will be letting you know specifically uh, what's going to be coming to our delegate agencies, and we will do that based on a, um, a funded slot basis. Um, the last item that I wanted to mention is the uh, annual report. So the 2020 annual report for Children's Services Division, it is published, it is on our website. Take a look. Um, and um, as, as you guys know, that is a requirement um, of the Head Start program is to publish your annual report. And so ours is posted for your review. All right, that is it. I think I have a few questions in the chat. And uh, are the ARP and CARES Act for PSA funded programs? No, Cindy, it's for federal. Um, those are for, those are Head Start funds. Um, and so Rachel had answered that. Are our PI programs funded by ARP? No, they're not. Um, it's our federal, uh, federal funding source. With that being said, thank you guys. If you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and email me. Next slide. Program operations. Thank you, Tiffany. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. This is B. Nichols, Director of Operations. Hope everyone is well. We have a few short updates for you. And so we want to talk about monitoring. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Elaine. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, happy fall, happy harvest, and happy, happy, right? Um, I'm going to be brief in my remarks um, regarding monitoring visits. Um, as many of you may already be aware that our teams have already started conducting um, their monitoring visits uh, for this fall. They are unannounced visits. Um, so um, if they are showing up at your door, um, please uh, allow them um, within appropriate measures to have them, let them come in and conduct their visits. They are primarily conducting their visits for our Head Start, Early Head Start, Early Head Start Child Care, Early Head Start Child Care Partnership Programs. Um, and then uh, later on in the program year, 
um, they will be conducting the visits for PFA PI. Um, the teams will uh, conduct any necessary follow-up um, as needed um, based on what their observations and findings are um, as it relates to them conducting these unannounced visits um, utilizing a snapshot document. I also want to remind all of our Chicago Early Learning Programs um, to ensure that your internal monitoring systems um, are being implemented and used, making sure that you're doing those accuracy checks to make sure that information um, is entered into the COPA database um, in a timely manner so that when we pull our reports, we can have the most accurate information. So make sure that that information is entered timely, make sure that the information is entered correctly um, and that um, children and families data is entered correctly as well. Um, I just wanna make sure that you are following your HR requirements as it relates for um, making sure that criminal record clearance checks are entered into the COPA system, um, as well as the physicals um, for staff, making sure that they are accurate and updated um, uh, for the current year. Want you to be mindful of the income and eligibility requirements um, for your families who have been enrolled in your program, especially your new families. And for our PFA PI funded programs, just want you to double check and make sure that your families are living um, within the city limits. Um, um, once you make sure that they are living within the city limits for those respective programs. And so I'm going to turn this uh, back over to V. Thank you, Elaine. <clears throat> well, we've been in program now for about well over 45 days. And I say that because now you're probably your teachers are looking at children's behaviors, looking at whether or not they're going to be perfect. So one of the resources that we want to present to you um, in our next case set is it's evidence-based and it's found to be effective uh, when you're planning for individualized interventions with children who are exhibiting atypical behaviors. If you're familiar with the pyramid model, uh, we're talking about those behaviors at tier three. And so this is a teaser. Hopefully I've stirred some interest and that you will join us at our next ASAP meeting where, we're, where we'll do a deeper dive with this. And with that, I wanna turn it over to Seth. Thanks, B. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, just wanna thank uh, everyone who um, responded to our staff, our staff wellness survey. Um, we asked that it come in uh, yesterday and we received um, a nice amount of uh, surveys and we even received a couple of plans. Um, I spoke with some of you and I just wanna say thank you uh, for the participation. Um, the questions on the survey uh, just uh, help us gauge uh, where you are at in the process of setting up a committee at your agency. And we really appreciate the participation, even though that our due date has passed, um, keep them coming in. And I did, I did get a couple of emails today that requested if they could send them uh, later today and Friday. And um, if you have not sent that email and that was your question, absolutely, um, keep them coming. But then uh, once again, thank you to everyone that has sent the staff wellness survey. Um, if you needed some additional guidance, I'm gonna put, uh, a meeting that we had uh, about the mental well, uh, health um, wellness um, and staff wellness in particular into the chat. It's just a recording that's on our YouTube link um, from Stephanie Cartwright from our ad hoc meeting that was uh, regarding the staff wellness uh, from July 29th, um, 2021. Um, I'm gonna move to the HSAC as B was speaking about some things that had come out in the HSAC. I can tell you that um, our, our HSAC meeting is gonna be November 5th um, at 10 a.m. Uh, you will see that come out in uh, upcoming CSD updates and alerts and we will make sure 
that you know about that, but even before it comes out, I can let you know that our HSAC meeting, our Health Service Advisory Committee meeting will be uh, November 5th. Uh, we will uh, go through, um, last year we developed some goals in each subcommittee. We will present those goals. We actually voted on those goals again on July 28th um, and hammered them down from two to one. So now each subcommittee has one goal. Um, we started some action steps. So we will revisit that and uh, implement, implement uh, the steps that we're gonna take to reach those goals for each subcommittee. We'll also be um, providing um, information uh, regarding health services and also having great conversations like we did last year and learning a lot from each other. And that's the Health Service Advisory Committee. Um, I'll post the link in the chat uh, from the wellness meeting and I'm going to pass it to quality. Awesome, awesome, thank you, Seth. Um, good morning, good morning, our partners. A um, few updates from our quality and program development unit. I um, want to share um, in this platform that our TSG funding sources are now up and running and all of your children in your uh, prospective classroom and sites um, shall be linked accordingly to their funding sources. We did send out a preliminary email on last week and also a video um, to help as an instructional video to help as a resource. Um, just to answer some of those questions as it relates to based on your funding programs that you receive, your funding models, uh, and, and through who you receive those funding sources through, um, how you can um, appropriately tag each and every last child in your in, in your care. Um, again, I, Tamela, at this point in time, I would ask that if you could please enter your email address there within the chat so that anyone can reach out with any um, additional uh, uh, questions or needs of support as it relates to our TSG funding, we can then funnel those through to the appropriate source to help you guys walk through tagging each and every last one of our children. As we do know that next Friday, October 29th is our fall checkpoint period. That is the last day to enter those observations for your children who are in their programs. Um, are you CBG? Missing information that's required um, within our COPA data system. Elaine, um, previously uh, from, from our operations unit, did mention um, about those IEIN numbers and those city of Chicago addresses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what we did do is send out a specific email to each and every last one of our agencies who we saw were missing um, um, relevant data as it relates to these program requirements in our data in our COPA data system. And so you guys can have that to use as well to really track and check off as you go in and make those corrections and update that information that is miss, that is missing um, for, us to, for us required to report out to our funders, state and federal. Um, also, I would like to mention our staff update form. If we can go back in as well, Tamela, please provide the link um, for the staff update forms. As you know, we we have many, many and various reasons to reach out to each and every last one of you as, as teachers and, and um, um, EDPDs and, and, and uh, uh, support staff at your various agencies. And so when we ask for the staff update form, it's really to be able to guide and target our communication um, as such. As it relates to TSG, we would like to reach out to your site directors and your education and disability coordinators. Um, as it relates to um, um, funding expenditures, we'd like to reach out to, we'd like to have that available to reach out uh, and support the messaging from our finance and our administration units as well. So in that case, we ask that you do um, make it a priority to complete the staff update form. The link is available in the chat um, so that we can have that update information as it relates to your prospective sites. Also, we do have a training coming up. Um, one of our last trainings of the month of October, um, October 26th, it's about our lead poisoning. Um, as we know, that is a mandated training. And, and so it is posted on COPA and we look, to, we look forward to have you um, go in and register your um, appropriate staff to be able to partake in that specific training. I do also know that we have a, a last minute resource um, for our zero to three 
um, conference is not on the guide here, but we did also send out that email on last evening um, from our from our unit. Thank you, Tamela. That is also posted in your chat, the Zero to Three conference link. There you will find the um, not only the link to register um, one or two of your um, um, key staff members from your prospective agencies, um, but also you'll find the sessions in which you can see um, what's offered at this week-long conference next week through the 25th through the 29th of October. Um, you will see what's, what's available there um, in order for you to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, so we do urge, we do ask and urge that you submit your request to attend this conference by the close of business on today. Um, and that wraps up for quality and our program development unit as it relates to our updates. If there are any questions, I will be monitoring the chat. I'll address Tamela, if you can post that as well for any follow-up questions, I truly appreciate that. Thank you all for your time. And we'll pass it right over to our finance um, unit, finance department, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nicole Roberts with the FSS Finance. I'll be giving you the finance updates today, beginning with the expenditure rates. Um, currently, for a Head Start and Early Head Start, we are 73% expended. Ideally, we would be fully expended at this time um, and fully vouchered through September 30th. I do know that there are a few voucher, a few budgets that are still in process um, impacting this um, expenditure rate. So um, I will address that in a later slide. Uh, for CCP and expansion, um, we are currently 49% and 48% expended. And ideally we would be at about 83% expended for those grants. Uh, most of those budgets have been processed and approved. Um, there are a few still outstanding. All right, so moving on to um, the early childhood block grant. We are 3% expended. Uh, we ideally would be expended through the first quarter, um, July through September of this grant. So that'd be about 25% for PI and then 10% for PFA. And then with the child care only, we are 2% expended. And ideally we would like to be at about 25% expended at this time through the first quarter. For um, Head Start, Early Head Start uh, budgets ending September 30th, um, we do have uh, budgets still remaining to be processed. And we ask that you, um, if you're, you haven't been notified for a budget approval um, as of yet, please check your eye supplier. If you don't see your approved budget, please reach out to your finance accountant. And we ask that you refrain from submitting any further vouchers. Um, we are holding off on processing several of those because there's vouchers in process, which um, delay our processing. We're unable to process budgets with any in-process vouchers. Um, your accountant for Head Start, Early Head Start is Sharon Davis. And we have her email here for you to reach out. Um, CCP and expansion, oh, I'm sorry, for the final vouchers uh, for those ending July and September, that deadline is November 11th. Um, we will make exceptions. We're able to make exceptions for budgets that are still in process. So um, please be sure to reach out to us. CCP and expansion, um, the final vouchers for these are January 11th. Um, and then same here that we are on hold for processing some of those budgets due to in-process invoices. Um, if you have any questions on your budget status, please reach out to Laverne Coleman. All right, uh, for FY22, PI and PFA, um, we, I did see, we do have several budgets that are still pending approval, which I did see this morning, uh, many of those beginning to be approved. So uh, please check your eye supplier for your approved uh, standard release PO for vouchering. Um, you should be receiving an email from your finance accountant, Monica Almanza, with your approvals as well, but you can always check your orders tab in iSupplier at any time. Uh, for childcare, all of the budgets were approved yesterday with the exception of one. 
And if you have any questions on those, please reach out to Selena Ruan. And moving on to the FY22 grant application submission, uh, we did receive, thank you for um, your quick turnaround for CCP and expansion feedback. Uh, we did, um, I believe that was resubmitted yesterday. And then uh, for Head Start, Early Head Start, Sharon Davis did send out communications to you all regarding feedback that we did receive. Um, and we are asking for you to provide the updated um, request uh, by the end of day today. So um, please be sure to check your emails and um, respond accordingly. And then uh, just a reminder for voucher submission, uh, we ask that you submit vouchers on, at a minimum on a monthly basis. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped the slide here. For um, Head Start Early, Head Start ending um, beginning August 1st through November 30th, we anticipate that um, those budgets will be processed and approved uh, hopefully by mid-November. And um, you will be receiving notification from your finance accountant on those. And the anticipated um, voucher deadline will be January 11th of 2022. And then for the CRF bridge funds, those budgets have began being processed. The deadline for those budgets ending December 31st will be January 28th, 2022. And the accountant for those budgets is Sharon Davis. So please reach out if you have any questions at all. All right, so I, I did that slide already, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then so for a uh, voucher, Submission and processing, again, a reminder to submit your vouchers at minimum on a monthly basis. We do understand that um, some of our internal delays are impacting this requirement, and we apologize, and we will work with you um, to get those submitted. But if you do have approved standard release POs, please be sure to submit your vouchers um, at least monthly. Um, you should currently be submitted through September 30th for all of those approved budgets at this time. And um, if you receive any debit memos or rejections, we ask that you reach out to your accountant to resolve those as soon as possible so that um, as we get closer to the end of the budget periods, we're not um, rushing um, trying to get those resolved last minute. Um, the voucher submitter should receive workflow notifications for those. And then you can also review all of your budgets, um, all of your invoices in iSupplier. And um, you can see the status within your iSupplier on those. Any questions, please reach out to your accountant and or myself. Uh, thank you. Nicole, thank you so much. I wanted to make a quick announcement, you guys. We wanna go ahead and get to Christina. Uh, Vera, but before we do that, I just wanted to let everyone know that Nicole Roberts is now our Director of Accounting um, for Children's Services Programs. We are so excited to have Nicole in this position. Okay, I'll call so you right now. I wanted to make sure that we all were aware um, that she is um, a resource for, for us, and she does have several accountants working under her. Um, but Glenn Lazan had left our organization a couple of months ago, and Nicole is the replacement. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Welcome Thank aboard, you. Nicole. We appreciate Thank it. You. Tom, we're ready for Christina. Great. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, we uh, today are uh, presenting um, a summary of months of work, um, very creative. As you may or may not know, we are the um, strategic communications uh, support service contractor for DFSS. And as part of our role as a strategic communications um, contractor, we manage the citywide recruitment effort. So we um, implement 
all of the recruitment citywide for Chicago early learning, um, you know, the paid media, billboards, buses, et cetera, uh, down to the um, agency support with custom materials, um, outreach teams out at events on, on the blocks throughout the summer, promoting your programs, um, explaining to parents the difference between CBOs and CPS and how CBOs offer all of these great services. So our teams are out there really um, recruiting on your behalf um, and also working with the city for strategic communication citywide. So as part of this effort, we um, made a shift. I think with COVID, uh, there was a lot of opportunity for pivoting. And so one of the things that we did was we shifted to a more relational outreach um, strategy, which allowed us to really talk to parents and understand what those barriers of entry um, were. So um, we did a um, relational outreach effort, which allowed us to talk to parents a little bit more and find out why they weren't enrolling. We did a survey that was implemented citywide, and uh, we also did focus groups. So what we're going to present is the summary of all of those findings and talk to you about what we're hearing from parents and hoping that these insights will help you as you think about how to move forward with your recruitment efforts. Um, our goal here is to support those efforts, um, implement them on a citywide, and then support yours on a more um, you know, hyper-local um, level. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Linda, who will be sharing the report findings um, with you all now. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you're all able to, um, to see my screen. Yes. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> So um, we'll go through very quickly um, what methodology we used. Uh, many of you were involved in this, in this research. Um, and then we'll quickly get to the insights and recommendations that we've made as a result. Um, so this is really honest and up-to-date feedback from more than 2,000 families and um, professionals who, who work in the programs that, um, that were surveyed. Um, and we, um, we included uh, a, a range of methods in, in our over, me overall methodology. We, um, we are really proud of our um, approach, which um, involves uh, using data in a purposeful manner. So um, we've developed an ongoing relational canvassing approach, which means that we're in touch with uh, families and, and all of you more often. Uh, we get more feedback from decision makers and uh, just in general have uh, more opportunities to connect with people whose uh, opinion we, we value. At a high level, we, um, we had some focus groups or think tanks uh, in November of last year. We we're in the process of planning those again. We had 45 respondents there. Uh, we also had some one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with uh, families that were difficult to bring together in a group. And then uh, we did a an email survey that had almost 1,500 respondents. And so all of this information that we are communicating to you today comes from those people. Um, most of the, the respondents to the email survey were, um, were CPS parents um, and um, uh, CBO families represented 8% of respondents, which is slightly lower than the, the uh, number of uh, families that have registered their children at CBOs right now. Um, but but this, this data comes from, from a few months ago. So essentially the responses that we got from families is in line with the number of people that um, are registering in the different programs available. Um, we were very happy to um, 
to realize that uh, the survey de uh, data really represents a diversity of lived experiences. So uh, for the um, sur email survey, uh, Latin, Black and Latinx families were, were well represented at, at 18 and 39%. Um, and then overall, uh, beyond the email survey, we, um, we know that 46% um, of, of the respondents to the email survey came from priority zip codes, but, but overall 60% of the families that we surveyed come from those priority zip codes. Uh, so so um, our survey was very effective. We had a 100% completion rate. Um, and in light of the success, we've designed new tools that provide rich data of this nature to CEL on, a, on an ongoing basis. So I'll get quickly to the insights. Um, I'm not able to see the chat. So Christina, if you don't mind letting me know if there are questions in the chat, I'd be very grateful. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, uh, we do know that this approach, this relational outreach approach does connect us to families. As I mentioned, we're in touch with, with families and educators and, and um, people like, those that are in attendance at this meeting more often. Um, and we also have developed outreach documentation that is consistent across um, Chicago Early Learning's outreach partners. And our, our goal really here is to consolidate this data and make it easier to analyze and act on. Uh, so relational outreach works because um, we are focused on actionable insights. Um, and um, we, we know that what rec the recommendations that we're making to Chicago Early Learning are, are readily actionable um, and uh, helpful to, to families. Uh, it's obviously a data-driven approach, both qualitative and quantitative data. And um, it gives Chicago Early Learning the opportunity to draw on these insights year round rather than waiting for an, an end of project report uh, and to become a, an embedded resource for its partners in the community. So um, some successful outcomes that we um, would like to report for this approach is that uh, you know, we, we heard from families time and time again that we want, they wanted increased, um, increased transparency. So um, we, uh, we've been communicating that consistently and um, in, that, in, in that vein, um, Chicago Early Learning has clearly communicated the benefits of applying early, which was much appreciated. Um, they have provided stakeholders with advance notice for the application announcement. And um, uh, there was an addition of an alert that informed families of the number of CPS seats for three-year-olds, uh, encouraging applications at CBOs, which are we see as successful outcomes of this, um, this approach that we've taken. Um, additionally, responsiveness during the pandemic has um, been something that has been successful uh, as a result of, of knowing about the concerns of families. So um, the CEL website is the most widely credited source of information on the pre-K application process. Um, also, Latinx and, and Black families, which are uh, represent a large part of our priority constituency, are enrolling children in pre-K at a higher rate, making up 6% of the total applications since launch. It might actually be higher now. It seems to increase every day. Um, so families choose which programs to enroll their children in or to apply to uh, by considering more than one factor. So 64% of the people that responded to our email 
survey said that there was more than one reason that they they chose a particular program. And the takeaway from this is that the process is complex. And uh, we've been encouraging Chicago Early Learning and, and they have been accommodating as many factors as possible. Um, in our world, that, that means uh, we offer multiple marketing streams so that people can learn about the different aspects of the programs that are available to their families in different ways. And, and so, you know, the necessity of multi touch point marketing is really, really important. Um, you can see in the in the bar charts on the uh, on the left. Uh, people are getting their information from so many different places. Um, so starting at the bottom friends and family teachers and other school staff, canvassers, the Chicago Early Learning website, and then all of the other print and, and um, other media, including the Chicago Early Learning Hotline um, and billboards, et cetera. The people are learning about Chicago Early Learning from, from all of those sources. And this, this quote from a parent at an outreach event really sums that up. Um, they said, so appreciative. I've been seeing the buses and heard you all on the radio. Then my sister told me about the programs and I said, if I keep hearing about it, this must be good. Um, so uh, touch points such as canvassing reached about the over 6,500 families. Um, and uh, so we are really, along with our partners, uh, getting out into the community at a um, at a time in history when you know it's it's even harder to do that. But we're we're um, communicating very effectively with the families that we serve. Um, I brought up transparency earlier because this was a common theme early on in the process. Transparency meant, uh, could you please provide more transparency about wait lists? But as the pandemic progressed, um, you know, in 2021, what transparency really means is uh, Chicago families are looking to Chicago early learning to be transparent about. Um, how the city is going to address these realities in 2021. Um, we, we've talked about this, this uh, particular bit of feedback from a parent before, but uh, our, uh, our canvassers encountered a parent in Englewood who said, you know, a baby was shot yesterday, a one month old, and, and you all are worried about preschool. What's the mayor doing to prevent violence? So there are, things that are top of mind for these families that um, are uh, that they they are asking for transparency on and those issues have changed since 2019 when transparency as I mentioned was was more of an administrative concern. Uh, I won't go through all of these quotes but you know the um, although transparency has has changed, people are still concerned about administrative transparency and are, are um, wondering, uh, you know, are, are needing to know how the, the process works as they move through the application process. Um, so the application form itself, there, there was a mixed response to this year's application. Uh, you know, there were some families that really loved it and navigated the application really comfortable and, and others, um, uh, you know, I said that, that it was a little bit more challenges. And uh, we did notice that the challenges were noted by parents and guardians that were applying on their phones versus those that were, were using a desktop. Um, uh, the effectiveness of the hotline was well appreciated, um, and 
Uh, so, you know, um, for the families that aren't as comfortable using technology to complete the application, this seemed to be um, a, a really great uh, source of information. Um, and again, I go back to the multiple touch points. Um, this is a, a really good example of it. Um, uh, the other th uh, good thing about the application now is that um, it now explicitly informs parents of three-year-olds that CPS does not have full day options for three-year-olds, uh, which points them to CBO options. And, and we saw that as a, as a benefit as well. Um, Linda, I know that um, we have just a couple minutes left to wrap up, so I don't know if there was um, just like uh, a couple final um, high priority points that we want to share, and then we can share out the presentation uh, uh, with everyone that wants to, you know, dive a little deeper. Sure. Um... So I guess one of the main points here is that the pandemic is still a concern for for families. Um, and, you know, as we've discussed in this meeting, things that people were worried about at the beginning of the pandemic are still things that they are worried about now. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, you know, we're continuing to message out that enrolling in pre-K is a matter of of some urgency. Um, one thing I do want to talk about to this audience very quickly is that um, we have noticed that the proportion of, uh, and I'm sure you all have as well, that the proportion of uh, applications to CBOs is higher this year. It's, it's over 9% uh, uh, as of yesterday. Um, and so that was something that we definitely wanted to call out. Um, which here, I'll end on this slide. So, um, you know, the impact that we made in 2021 versus 2019 is that we reached more families, 8,600 versus 4,800. And then, as I mentioned, CBO registration is, is increasing with 7% of the registrants in 2019 going to CBOs and 9.1 in 2021. Thank you, Linda. Um, are there any um, questions for us? Great. So we'll end there and we'll hand it back over to Tom. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Caroline Packenham, and I'm here today from Elevate, which is a nonprofit here in Chicago. And I just want to start by thanking all of you for having me here today. I'm really excited to introduce you to a new lead and water mitigation program for child care facilities in Chicago. If we go to the next slide, I do just want to briefly introduce you to Elevate in case you haven't heard of our organization before. We are, like I said, a nonprofit here in Chicago, and we've been working with the child care community for the past 20 years to address lead hazards in child care facilities. And most recently, this has included helping child cares test and mitigate sources of lead in drinking water. And this has included, we work with the Illinois Department of Public Health to administer a program called Lead Care Illinois, which just came on this year. And it's a free lead and water testing program for all licensed child care providers in the state. So if you haven't heard of that before, definitely encourage you to, to learn more about it and, and take advantage of the resources or point someone in that direction. And if we go to the next slide, um, you know, the goal of the, the presentation today and, and why we're here is to give you an overview of this new lead and water mitigation program that's coming for um, the city of Chicago and, and child care providers and facilities. However, before we introduce you to that program, I do want to give you a little bit of background information about the lead and water landscape for child care providers in Illinois including why it's so critical to test and mitigate sources of lead. 
I'm guessing most all of you on this call are already familiar with this context, but in case you're not, it's a really good baseline and reminder to have before we introduce this mitigation program to you. Um, from there, what we'll then do is go over the nuts and bolts of the program that's coming online, including the type of activities that will be covered for providers and facilities, how we're going to prioritize facilities as part of this program, and then the various parties that will be involved, because it will take a, a village to, to make this program really successful. And then finally, I do want to save a little bit of time at the end in case you have any questions about the new mitigation program that's coming. All right, if we go to the next slide, you know, as I'm sure most all of you are aware, um, there are certain child care facilities in Illinois, in particular, if they were built on or before January 1st of 2000. Um, and this includes home, center, and group-based facilities that are required to test their drinking and cooking water sources for lead. And if a provider or facility finds lead in their water at a level of 2.01, what's called parts per billion or higher, they do need to develop what's called a mitigation plan and undergo mitigation. So activities to kind of bring those lead levels down below that action level of 2.01 parts per billion. Um, these requirements came online in 2019. So facilities have been dealing with this for a while now. In addition to the, the testing and mitigation requirements, you know, speaking of transparency, this was something that was brought up in the presentation before, but providers and facilities, they also have to share these results with DCFS and their child care community as well. So there's transparency embedded in this process that, as well. At the time these requirements came out for child care providers, there weren't a lot of resources available to really support the child care community in complying with these testing standards. Um, a huge kudos to DFSS. And then Elevate also did work with the child care community here in Chicago to help with some of these requirements. But in terms of of really robust resources. We haven't had a ton um, to support the child care community with these testing standards. If we go to the next slide, and I think we can all agree and recognize that um, facilities, they have experienced a lot of challenges in complying with these new standards, but these standards are really important. And this is because lead, as I'm sure you're aware, it's a toxic metal. And it can really have a detrimental impact on human health. And this is for adults and children. And what we see is that at even low levels, lead in blood, it can result in harmful impacts to a child's developing brain and their nervous system. And what this can lead to is behavior and learning problems, lower IQ, and then underperformance in school. Children are the most vulnerable, particularly young children, to the damaging effects of lead because their bodies, they're still de developing and they can absorb more of the harmful metal than adults. And the EPA estimates that about 20% of our exposure to lead can come from drinking water. And if you're a formula fed infant, that percentage can actually rise to between 40 and 60%. So just a little background information and context for you about why testing is so important and why this new mitigation program we have coming online is, is so critical. If we go to the next slide. So now that we have this context about the lead and water landscape in Illinois, um, it's time to introduce you to the really exciting part, which is the lead and water mitigation program that will be available to providers very, very soon. Um, so Elevate's excited to share that in partnership with the city of Chicago, we have been awarded $2 million from the US EPA's Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation Act. This is called the WIN Act. And this is to offer free lead and water mitigation resources to licensed child care providers in Chicago. So this is huge. We haven't had this dedicated funding to actually help with the mitigation um, for this wider group of providers for, for a long time. And so, you know, up until this point, outside of these efforts provided by DFSS and Elevate, again, we just haven't had a lot of these resources. And so with this new mitigation program, our goal is going to be to help providers identify sources of lead in their drinking water, 
and then remove those sources of lead in drinking water by connecting them with mitigation services. And this is ultimately going to help them have a safe and healthy learning environment for children, but also comply with these testing standards. We go to the next slide. You may be wondering when this program is, is going to kick off. Um, we did receive official news from EPA early this fall that all the kind of things you have to go through with your application were complete. And so the funding has been officially approved. And because of that, we now undergo what's called a quality assurance project plan with the EPA, which is about a 90 day period. So in reality, we're looking to start some of the actual work in facilities in the early part of, of 2022. And with the funding that we're getting from EPA, along with cost share support from the city of Chicago, we, we wouldn't be able to do this without this cost share support from the city of Chicago. We estimate that we'll be able to help between 200 and 250 child care facilities, and this is home or center-based, with mitigation activities over the next three years. So we're looking at about 70 facilities per year. We'll probably be a little bit lower that first program year since we're getting started at the early part of the year. Um, and then we are certainly looking to work with Head Start funded sites as part of this project. So we'll definitely be coordinating with DFSS um, on that aspect of the program as well. If we go to the next slide, you know, with this new program, we really will have kind of four main activities that providers and facilities will go through from start to completion. So I want to just give you a little bit of flavor of, of what that will look like for facilities. Naturally, our, our first activity that's going to be outreach to providers about the, the opportunity itself. And here we'll be targeting providers who we know have lead in their drinking water, and we'll be prioritizing those with the highest lead levels first. And then once a provider applies to and agrees to participate in the program, we then move to an assessment phase. And this is where Elevate and a plumbing contractor, what we're doing is we're really reviewing the facility's lead and water test results that they've already you know, conducted. <clears throat> and then we also conduct a plumbing assessment walkthrough of the facility to develop a scope of work to reduce the lead levels in the facility. And then we present that scope of work to the facility. They do need to sign off on it and then work can begin. And that's when we move into the mitigation phase. And with the mitigation phase, this is where we have a licensed plumbing contractor perform the work, and then Elevate is responsible for that, the QA, QC on the work that is performed. And throughout this entire process, we are definitely going to be giving templates and talking points to the facility to help them communicate with parents and, and families throughout the entire process about what's going on. And then once that work is complete, that's when we move into the evaluation phase. And this is really critical. Anytime mitigation work is done, we really need to make sure that it is being effective and it's reducing the lead in drinking water. And so what we're doing in, in this phase of the project is we're conducting additional sampling at any outlet that had had the lead in drinking water and where we're performing mitigation to make sure the lead levels come down. And if the lead levels do not come down, then we do need to revisit the mitigation plan and Elevate will work with the facility and continue that, that action and follow-up testing, <clears throat> excuse me, until those lead levels come down. So that's just a quick overview of kind of the process flow of the lead and water mitigation program. If we go to the next slide, just a few other elements I wanted to touch on for you. You know, we're really lucky to have this mitigation funding coming to Chicago, but we do know that it's likely not enough funding to help every provider in the city who likely has lead in their water. And so because of this, we are prioritizing providers. Um, and first we're going to prior prioritize those who have lead levels at 10 parts per billion or higher first, and those living in opportunity zones in the city of Chicago. So this is a, a zone that's economically distressed. So that'll be kind of our first tier. And then once we've prioritized those groups, we'll then move to, to helping any provider who found that in their water at 2.01 parts per billion or higher because they do have to mitigate. And a lot of these providers and facilities have had to rely on short-term mitigation strategies until they can get more permanent um, solutions implemented. 
in their facility. And that brings us to the, the next slide, which is you may have questions about what mitigation activities we'll be focusing on for this project. And so with the funding we have in place, we really are going to be focusing on more permanent mitigation strategies when we can at facilities. Because again, a lot have already you know, put in place more short-term actions. And so we can perform most any type of mitigation activity if it's internal to the building. And so this means we can install things like new faucets and fixtures. And again, this is all free of charge for the facility. We can replace internal pipes that may contain lead. We can install auto flushing devices, points of use filters, uh, water bottle filling stations that can contain filter devices. And we can also disconnect problem outlets. We are unable with the funding to replace lead service lines as part of this project. That's something you may have heard of. This is a, a pipe that connects the water main in the street to a facility. It delivers water and sometimes these are are made of lead. So unfortunately we can't do that external work, but we will be looking to see if one of these lines is connected to the facility and continuing to look for opportunities to fund that type of mitigation activity. But again, we're really excited about this. Um, these are more permanent measures for the childcare facilities. And we know the support has been needed for a long time. And, and finally, um, our last slide here, you might be wondering who all is involved in the lead and water mitigation um, program that's coming online. You know, obviously our, our key stakeholder is the childcare facilities, um, really wanting to, to serve and benefit them with this project. But in order to provide them with the support, we'll be working um, with DFSS to conduct outreach and coordinate activities with Head Start funded sites. Um, we'll be working with the City of Chicago's Department of Water Management. They have a lot of great expertise um, and looking to them for advice on mitigation activities. Um, Elevate will be managing the project activities, including coordination with the child care facilities and the plumbing contractors. And then throughout this entire process, we'll be collaborating with US EPA as they are the grant administrator. And then finally, a little bit earlier on, I mentioned that there is this statewide lead and water testing program called Lead Care Illinois. And we will be utilizing that program for the follow-up supplies for, for lead and water testing at the child care facilities. If we go to the last slide. Um, you know, I just really hope this preview of this new program has been helpful for you. We're more than happy to keep you updated on, on progress once we get started in facilities and just really thrilled to see the support coming to Chicago, and, and we couldn't have done it without the city of Chicago. So thank you. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any that have come through, and you're always welcome to reach out to me at the email address you see on this slide. So thank you. With that, I will pass it back over to the next presenter. Hi, I think that's uh, me. Is, should I go ahead and get started? Yes, Kate, go ahead. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm Kate Ansorga. I'm with IFF. I am here on behalf of my colleague, Dana Garner, um, who's out this week and uh, who's our program manager for IFF's Quality Facilities for All. I'm here today to talk about IFF's technical assistance that we're offering early child care providers. Um, so with that, I'll just give you, go into the next slide. I'll give you a little bit of information about IFF. So IFF, um, for those of you who don't know IFF, we're a nonprofit. We uh, really work at the intersection of facilities and finance. So we've been working with early childhood organizations around facility um, for 30 years. And um, we we're, we're also work a lot with uh, providing financial support. So we act as a lender, we act as a real estate consultant, we occasionally are a developer ourselves, and um, we call ourselves a social impact accelerator and bringing programs and policy and resources, um, particularly to the early childhood community. Go on to the next slide. So IFF has, for, since we started, had a commitment to quality facilities in early childhood. Our first uh, loan was to an early childhood organization over 30 years ago. And we believe strongly that quality facilities are strongly connected to the program and impact that early child care providers are making with the families and children. And uh, specifically with the Quality Facilities for All program, we're looking to address things like indoor air quality, temperature control, 
ventilation, noise, lighting, classroom furniture, and outdoor play areas. And so we're looking to bring resources through grant funding and technical assistance to help early childhood uh, providers be able to implement this in their facilities. One next slide. So uh, what is Quality Facilities for All? Our technical assistance program is an initiative to help provide support to early child care providers who want to apply for the State of Illinois Early Childhood Construction Grant Program. So this is an anticipated grant program that will provide major capital to early childhood organizations who want to apply. It's available statewide, and uh, we are anticipating that the application will become available in the near future. There's not an exact or not a date known of when the application will be released, but we're here today to talk about some of the technical assistance that we can provide to help people plan for that. On the next slide. So we have uh, kind of major priorities of how we want to support early childcare organizations who want to apply for capital grant funding. Um, our target is working with organizations who are expanding infant toddler classrooms, who are converting infant toddler classrooms or enhancing them. So this is a existing center that um, may or may not serve infant toddler right now, but wants to uh, add those services to their program or is serving infant toddler right now and is looking to perhaps address some of the classroom quality issues that I mentioned before. So looking to get capital money to be able to make renovations in classrooms that are serving the infant toddler community. And so we're looking, we call it both enhance and expand access to infant toddler um, and uh, by supporting these organizations put together their capital applications to the state of Illinois. On to the next slide. So IFF um, anticipates that organizations um, may not have time, capacity, um, resources to be able to pull everything together for the application. And so we're offering to provide technical assistance support to help with this. So this could look like helping prepare the development budget and timeline, helping with the concept plan of how those capital funds could be used to make quality impact, um, looking at other real estate related things. So site plan, concept design. Uh, we anticipate that the state of Illinois will require site ownership to be able to apply for this capital, which I know is a big deal for a lot of operators who may not own their sites. Um, and so if there's assistance that we could help with uh, purchasing the buildings that they're in or purchasing another property that they want to expand to, that we would help with that. So we would be supporting that with real estate related and also anticipate having some support with the grant writing itself. And the next slide. So what do you um, need to be eligible to apply for the technical assistance with IFF? So we are looking at the following high need communities. So this would be an operator who's serving populations from Aurora, Champaign, East St. Louis, or Rockford, or there's three Chicago neighborhoods, Inglewood, Roseland, or South Lawndale. The state of Illinois requires that applicants be a nonprofit. This is for center-based early childhood programs. We are looking to support organizations that have a minimum bronze rating in the Accelerate QRS. We are looking for organizations that have been in business for at least four years. And as I said earlier, this is targeting that there needs to be some improvements to infant toddler. If there is other improvements at the center that aren't specific to infant toddler, that would also um, be something that could be included in the application, but there needs to somehow be touching infant toddler um, services in this program. Next slide. So the applications to work with IFF um, to receive the free technical assistance are due on October 25th at 5 p.m. Um, there's a link here to learn more about the Quality Facilities for All Technical Assistance Program. And then there's also, even if you aren't interested in working with us um, through the free technical assistance, we have a fact about what we think we what the Early Childhood Capital Grant Program is going to look like based on um, policy, people who are working on this grant opportunity. And so you can just go learn more about the grant opportunity through that FAC. So I'm here today just to encourage everyone to spread this to providers who might be eligible and want to apply. And um, Dana is not here, but uh, I have her email here, Dana Garner at IFF. And that's it. Thanks everyone. Started this, when I started, I said we had a full agenda for you. Um, I know sometimes we do end early. It is right now 11.59. I've been looking at the chat box um, as we've been moving forward, trying to see whether or not there were any other questions and I did not see any. Um, as always, at the end of our presentations, 
um, the team works with um, the video um, and it ends up on our YouTube site. So you and your other staff have access to it. Um, I did ask, um, for example, and Heather mentioned it for her slide so that we can actually share some of that information with you as well. And so we are going to continue to be busy. We know you're busy out there. Um, and we wanna really thank you, each and every one of you for taking the time out today, uh, two full hours to be with us this morning. We hope that you've gotten something from today's presentation that's gonna be useful for yourself, for your staff, for your families, for your children, and definitely for you and your own family. And so again, we wanna thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I do have a question, will DFSS allow for more infant mental health consultants for program staff? Um, we can talk a little bit more about mental health consultants. I know the team and I um, have had a little bit of discussion um, and we will come back to you with some more information. So thanks for raising that one. Ms. Um, Sarathal, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. No, go um, ahead. But there is going to be on Monday, um, there is going to be um, infant mental health and early childhood mental health office hours with the National Center for Health, Behavioral Health and Safety. Do you want me, can I send you the link to register for that if folks are interested? Absolutely, you send it and okay. we'll get it right out. So thank okay. you. Okay, yeah, that. no problem. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so we'll, more information is always going to come. Um, we have many resources. Remember one of the things that we added to our CSD update is a mental health corner where we're constantly putting up information up there with links and other information for you uh, to access. Because again, our health is the way that we're able to be healthy in relationships. And so again, I wanna thank you. We will get the information out that um, Heather just mentioned. Uh, you will have access to this recording. And as always, we're here, all of us available uh, for you and support of you. So again, everyone, thank you for spending time with us today and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. If we don't hear or see you between now and Friday, have a great weekend. Uh, so take care of everyone and take care of yourself.